Hello and welcome to the Bedroom Studios podcast, the podcast where we talk about what goes on behind the scenes in the musician's world and bridge the industry gap by bringing their stories, expertise, and advice to early career artists. Subscribe to join us for a fun chat about life as a creative person, tips and tricks for pursuing an artistic career, navigating the music industry, and more. My name is Emma De La Rosa. I'm a singer, songwriter, and flute player based in Toronto, and today I will be interviewing Kristen Antunes. Kristen Antunes is a music industry professional and musician based in Toronto, Ontario. She is a graduate from the University of Toronto's Masters of Music Technology and Digital Media program, where she studied music business, entrepreneurship, marketing, psychology, recording, and production. She also holds a Bachelor of Music and minor in Sociology from the same institution, and is regularly requested as a guest lecturer for extracurricular programs such as Future Sound 6 and the Amplify Mentorship Program. Kristen was recently selected for the Women in Music Canada Leadership Accelerator Program, learning new business strategies from a wide variety of industry leaders and joining a community of high-achieving women in Canadian music. She holds extensive experience from across the music industry, including rights management, artist management, music publishing, and digital media development, and currently works as an account executive with Canadian music rights organization SOCAN. In her work at SOCAN, Kristen manages high-profile member accounts, spearheads policy developments and revisions, and acts as a mentor for the company's summer internship program. She is regularly consulted for her knowledge in music publishing and has organized staff SQL training to improve data literacy. She is a staunch advocate for music rights and equitable compensation for artist work, and is regularly commissioned as an arranger, producer, and performer for artists and schools across Canada. More information regarding Kristen's creative work can be found at her website, www.antunesmusic.com. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I'm so glad you're here. Well, thank you so much for having me. You have a lot of experience in both the creative performance-based side and also the music business side, and I'd love to talk about both of these worlds. For sure. So why don't we start by listening to one of your musical arrangements? Sure. Uh, yeah, so I did a little, I call it one of my like, Insta minis. I started doing those during, I guess, lockdown. Um, and this one is a stand by one of my favorite artists, Yabba. Can you stand in the rain when summer's gone and there's no use at waiting out all the time? Oh, in vain, seeping deeper to blame when you went away moonlight took the day stars and darkness all collided in the loneliest of space when you went away my universe divided all that's left is the matter of asking myself will you stay the universe divided over all of me yeah Deep into my soul Finding my reflection in the mercury Mercury Turning my transgressions into gold Oh, oh, oh Can you stand the rain? Make it through all the things they say Hey, hey, love this i your voice is so well suited to this song oh thank you i think yabba's had a really big influence on my like singing style <laughs> yeah oh my gosh i'm just like so blown away by all of your vocal runs and all of that oh adverbs. thank you <laughs> so you kind of just said this but i wanted to ask what are some of your musical influences that have impacted your arranging style yeah i mean i used to do arranging more broadly i still do but the bulk of my work is a cappella, and so I think I'm. I've been inspired by a lot of different a cappella arrangers. Like, I think Ben Bram is probably really high up there. He's just kind of like a famous a cappella arranger. Works a lot with pentatonics and other groups like that. Um, and then I got a lot of inspiration from others, and even my collaborators. Like, 
in the collegiate acapella scene. So they definitely really influenced my arranging style, like literally friends of mine, like Min Holly or Randy Chang and things like that. Um, but musically overall, um, definitely inspired by songwriters and vocalists like Yeba. She's like, she's a talent like no other in my, my humble opinion. Um, I, I feel like no one really compares to her. And even as a songwriter, I feel like I'm so, so inspired by her writing, um, both melodically and lyrically. Mm. I haven't gone too far into the world of acapella music and arranging, but I love doing harmonies and like vocal harmony stuff in my own music. I It's one of my passions. So um, I find that, especially as a songwriter, when I'm coming up with vocal arrangements, I very much think of the voice as its own instrument. Um, and it's own like an it's like an instrumental layer. It's like adding piano or adding guitar to something. I kind of approach voice in the same way. Yeah, and, definitely. Yeah, I feel like uh, even when I was veering more into songwriting, which I did, like I released an EP in twenty twenty that was part of my master's thesis. So there was more original songwriting on that, and I haven't I haven't delved back into it enough to get back into recording my originals. But even when I was recording, then I remember thinking. Wow, uh, the the additions that I think of when it comes to arranging my own songs are always vocal. I think mm. that's just because that's where my brain is housed. But yeah, I think songwriting with vocals is also interesting because I think that process influenced my arranging style. Like I've, I veered away from the traditional acapella of you know, like the stereotypical stuff you'd hear in Pitch Perfect, kind of like mm. the dum 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 and the jun 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 and that stuff. Yeah, <laughs> find it a, a little bit. Uh, cheesy on occasion I think it has its purposes but I I kind of I feel like my arranging style lately has veered more into keeping with the you know an acapella ensemble but using things more like background vocals like you'd expect to hear in a in a pop song rather than giving people syllables to sing or vocables to sing Mm -hmm. in the cover that you did I felt that it was just so fluid and it it really captured you have a songwriting style and just having it where it just grabs you, you know, it grabs you and you're just, you're there with it from beginning to end. I think the thing about arranging that I find can be a challenge is uh, maybe you find this with songwriting too, is if you, if you feel really inspired by one section of the song, it's easy to come up with an idea for that, but then transitioning mm-hmm. into those sections can be really challenging. Um, I find that to be the hardest part sometimes because I'm like wow I really like this idea for the bridge but getting here is going to be a challenge yeah. <laughs> are there any things that or any strategies that you use to help overcome that challenge I will say with arranging I feel like I have these ideas that I lean back on like cascading ideas I know I did one in the Yeba cover and or um you know a soft opening building into something larger later on um, that's helpful in songwriting. I find it a lot more challenging because that's why I haven't really put myself back in studio mode for any of my original writing lately. Cause I've been like, oh, this is a great chorus and I have no idea how to contextualize it. That's mm-hmm. the biggest challenge for me. If things aren't free flowing. It's, it's hard. Yeah. But arranging wise, it's much easier. <laughs> yeah. I find doing covers and coming up with ideas for covers are so much easier because there is everything's already there and yeah, definitely. like I can recreate things in terms of the the production of it or if I'm doing something more acoustic it's still inspired by a pro- the production that already exists but then when I'm yes. coming up with something on my own like I don't know what to do I'm not a producer and yeah. so I, you know like what do yeah. I do I feel similarly I mean with my songwriting it's always like I'm sitting here writing this with just me and a piano so it's almost it's almost like, um, like you were saying, the production of it is the challenge. Mm-hmm. It's easy to pull from ideas when you're arranging something that already exists, the production is done, but actually having to arrange my own songs, it's a whole other can of worms. It's mm-hmm. also fun for arranging or even doing covers to kind of flip it on its head. Like if you're, if you like a song, but you can think of it a little bit critically and think, what would I have done on this song instead? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then you have the opportunity to actually do that. Like maybe a reharmonization or, you know, melodic yeah. change. It's like making it your own. Yeah. Yeah, especially when, like, sometimes I'll want to do a cover of a song that just doesn't fit with my voice. And I'm like, hmm, how can I make this slow and sad and acoustic? <laughs> and then I, yeah. 
<laughs> but that's what I like about songwriting because I feel like my range is kind of limited. I don't have a strong upper range. Like I can't belt very high and things like that. So when I write my own songs, I'm like, well, of course this is suited to my voice. I wrote it. <laughs> I don't have I to worry do about like singing the high note in my head voice. <laughs> I'm like, why do I, why do all of, why are all my songs so hard to sing? Like, fair. I, you did it to yourself. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but then you can always just transpose it down. Um, That's true. If you want. It's like my song, we're doing this. Yeah. Many, many, many steps lower than the way I wrote. Exactly. Make it easier. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in your bio, you mentioned that you had a lot of opportunities to arrange for different groups. And so I was wondering if you wanted to go into uh, some of the opportunities you had in the world of arranging that has helped you career-wise. Yeah, I think, I mean, I started arranging in high school and I've maintained a really strong relationship with my high school teachers. I adore them and I'm really grateful to still work with their students. So uh, there's been opportunities to arrange for their students today and that has led to some cool stuff. Like in 2020, um, I arranged a cover of, oh, what's the song? That's all I've got to say. Um, Originally written by Jimmy Webb. It was a very, very... Um, awarded songwriter in the States. Um, he saw the video, it gained some traction online, oh. and then he kind of came back to the group asking if they would sing background vocals for a re-release of another song he was doing with Thelma Houston, who was also a famous kind of Motown era singer, I believe Motown era. Could be getting that wrong. Um, but with that, I got asked to do the vocal arranging on that. So it was really cool to rewriting for the choir again, but in the context of something that wasn't acapella, working with these really fantastic producers um, and recording engineers, um, all remotely, you know, none of us were going down to, I think they were all based in Nashville at the time, but because of COVID, yeah. So that was really cool. Um, I work now a lot, well, I'm in a group called Beat Sync, uh, kind of an offshoot of the collegiate group that we were all in at some point in time, TBA, Tunes Beats Awesome, not U of T, uh, funny name. But yeah, Beat Sync is really cool. Um, we're very committed to kind of innovative acapella and not being confined by traditional acapella limitations. Like we are very open to the use of electronics, looping, pre-recorded material during live performances. And it's been cool to think about ways to integrate that and explore that in arranging. It's not something I typically get to do. You know, when I'm working with traditional acapella choirs, it's just voices and nothing else. And this is still voices, but it's really fun to have that room to play and, you know, what kind of sounds we might be able to come up with when we add those elements. Very cool. And congrats hmm. on, on that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It's, it's fun. I mean, I kind of say it's just my freelance business now. Uh, but it still has afforded me a lot of really cool opportunities. I'm really grateful for it. Mm-hmm. And do you have um, a process that you fall back on when you're arranging or is it different every time? I think, I mean, it sounds pretty simplistic, but I always just transcribe the melody first. And then I tend to work through just like from start to finish unless, unless I'm feeling particularly challenged by an intro or something. Um, like we were talking about before, using the pre-existing material, like it's already there for you, right? So mm. if I really want to, I can. I know I can, at the very least, do what's more of like a lift arrangement where I'm not really uh, pulling away too much from the original material. Uh, it's not my favorite style of arranging, but I know if I get a commission for something that I'm not feeling particularly inspired by, it's something I can at least fall back on. But um, yeah, if I'm, I'll, I'll start where I feel more inspired if that's not the beginning and then try to build around that or see how I can, you know, we talked about those transitional things into it. Um, And maybe I'll weave them together. Like if I have a great idea for the chorus, but not for the verses, then I'll do more of a lift for those and branch out more in the choruses. Mm -hmm. And this is, is this all done on like a notation software? Yeah, I arranged straight into Sibelius, which I don't know if anyone has particularly strong feelings about that, but I can imagine some people wouldn't recommend because I guess it takes the vocal element out of it or the performance mm-hmm. element out of it, right? Like it's straight pen to paper. Um, I know a lot of people who will sing first into Logic and then transcribe those parts or you know play into Logic and then transcribe. I totally see the value in that. I just find most of the time I'm working in conditions that, you know, a lot of my arranging was done 
up until the hours of like 2 a.m. in a dorm or at my parents' house. And I got really used to just arranging right into Sibelius. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you you've gotten those like people knocking on the walls on the other on the other side of the room. It's like stop singing. It's yeah. midnight. I never got those, but I was always I was always very wary of other people hearing me in general. Like even mm. in dorms, I was like, is someone gonna hear me practicing? That made me nervous, which is mm. weird because I'm a musician. But <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, I was always very weary. I don't know. The voice is so personal too. Yeah, it really is, especially with singing. Um, and then, I mean, I was a sax major at first, but I pretty quickly abandoned that because mm. I was like, um, classical saxophone doesn't seem like the most lucrative option for me. Um, <laughs> no offense to the classical saxophone. That just wasn't my thing. Um, yeah, I didn't want to be playing in my dorm room either. Mm. Instruments are loud. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go play in the quad instead. Wake everybody up. <laughs> I think if you're, I don't know, I feel like if you're the kind of person who can generate ideas quickly, it's kind of, whether you do it through recording into, into Logic or doing it on a notation software, it's kind of, the ideas are coming at the same speed. It's just more of how you're recording them. That's true. I think, I think it's the... If there was a criticism of my approach, which I would totally understand, it's just that not being voice first or not being instrument first in the arranging process can make things perhaps more robotic or less mm. singable if you're not being careful. Um, but I, you said something that kind of struck something in me. If, if you're doing things quickly enough, um, I definitely think of myself as very practical in my arranging in that regard. I'm like, there's no perfectionism here get it done and then mm. if it's not cohesive i can edit it later but at least it'll be something on the page um because i work with arrangers who are very focused on like having the right idea the first time and i'm like i understand but we also have deadlines <laughs> and i'd rather have something available and finished than not and it kind of resonates in the songwriting world too not necessarily in the sense of deadlines but <laughs> you know that quote all the thing all of your favorite artists have in common is that they actually release their music <laughs> uh, it kind of reminds me of that just like you have to finish things yeah. to do them <laughs> yeah there's there's another quote that i that i like where it's like, the the best thing about creating art is the art and the worst thing about creating art is the creating part of it <laughs> yeah for sure it makes sense. I mean, and it's not to be critical of people who are very like perfectionistic about the process. It's just, you know, a lot of people get really tied up in the mix and the details and then things don't get finished or released. I don't think, mm -hmm. I don't think that's that helpful paralysis. to anybody. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I've, I, I've been finding myself going back on like through my notebooks or my voice memos and looking at ideas that I had in the past year and it's it's really interesting to go back I like, I'm the kind of person where when I write something I have a period of like this is the worst song ever and I hate it um and so I have to leave it alone for a bit That's but then horrible. when I'm coming yeah honestly <laughs> <laughs> then when I'm when I'm coming back to it I can sort of view it from a more objective stance and it's like having I don't know, I'm just thinking of like a, this analogy where it's like if you don't come up with anything because you're too afraid of what's going to happen, then then you don't really, you don't have anything to work with. But then if you're just, if you're just putting stuff on paper, then it's like having a lump of clay and then you could always go back and like shape it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I look back sometimes at the, the first mixes and the first songs I produced and even the songs that I've released. Like I don't necessarily think that every single mix I've done is like top-notch work, but I'm very happy it's out there and I'm mm -hmm. very happy it's representative of what my skills were at the time. And I'd rather have them out there than not have anything at all. Yeah. And then you can just appreciate where you were at at the, at yeah, the time Yeah, exactly. You made it. Yeah. yeah. Transitioning into more of what you're doing on the music business side, I was wondering if you would like to kind of just like an overview of what your role is and what you do. Yeah, so I'm an account executive at SOCAN, um, Canadian Music Rights Organization. So 
as a business, so can collect and distribute royalties for Canadian songwriters and publishers. And my role specifically, I kind of have a roster of different publisher and songwriter members, and I'm, I'm like their day-to-day contact and kind of like an account manager for them. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. And so in terms of, I'm not, okay, I'm not very knowledgeable with music business stuff, but I'm working on it. Um, and so, and I'm sure people listening probably like, you know, might not have gone very far into learning about the music business. Yeah. Can you speak more to what, what SoCan does, uh, in terms of performing rights? Is it, is it just performing rights that SoCan does or are there different kinds? So we do performing and reproduction rights. Performing is the bulk of what we do because reproduction rights is a much newer venture. But um, performing rights is any public performance or broadcast of a musical work. So that could be anything from, you know, a concert, your song gets played on the radio, television, someone streaming it on Spotify, um, and money coming in from foreign countries as well we cover. So Mm -hmm. so SoCan collects licenses from concert venues, small businesses that play your music in the background, television stations, radio stations, any major DSP like a Spotify or an Apple Music, any of those types. We collect license fees from them. um, And then we get the performance data that goes along with that. So, you know, people are submitting their set lists for concerts. DSPs will provide us with the streaming data. uh, And then we take the license fees and the performance data, see who got played what, and divide up the license fee paid out to our members. So we do that domestically where we're collecting from all of those businesses in Canada, but we're also paying out globally. So not only are we paying out to Canadian songwriters and publishers that are members of SOCAM, but let's say someone like an American songwriter's song gets played in Canada, we're sending that money to one of the American societies to pay out to their member. Um, And we do that globally. So it kind of works in reverse. The same thing would happen in the States. If Canadian music is being played in the States, the states, uh, the organizations in the states are going to collect that money and then send it to us to give to our member. So at the end of the day, we're kind of just making sure that people get paid. Um, and yeah, that's that's the bulk of it. That's is that's a very complicated process. It's honestly music copyright and the entire system. It's very convoluted and difficult to understand. So I don't blame people for not getting it. Um, it it's very confusing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, in terms of like the different roles in the in the industry uh i was wondering if you if you could tell us what um what is music publishing and what is the role of a music publisher yeah so that's a little bit i'll do my best because yeah yeah i think it's a common misconception that so a music publisher and we're not mm-hmm. um but we have publisher members so a music publisher is you as a songwriter or a composer or you know maybe your entire band you're going to sign up as individual songwriters uh with you enter into like a publishing agreement so i know a lot of people talk about like getting a label deal this is not a label deal it's just on the publishing side and i think a lot of the differentiation has to do with the type of copyright involved um so publishing deals well they can collect on a variety of rights in my world it's mostly performing rights because that's kind of like the bread and butter of what socan does um but they help you grow as an artist or as a composer songwriter. Um, they can help you find things like sync placements. So mm-hmm. ways to get your music into film and television. Um, they look for yeah different opportunities to grow your catalog. Very cool. Because of the world that I deal with, I mean, I see them in that capacity. I know they have a lot more functions, but mm-hmm. in my day-to-day work, I can't like, I don't really speak to <laughs> the yeah, role of a publisher. Good. But um, yeah, a lot of major labels have publishing branches. So, you know, major labels will likely have a publishing branch in addition to their label activities. Um, But smaller indie companies might just be publishers and just offer publishing services and things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know they do a lot with um, contacting radio and magazines and blogs and things like that. Just like having people write about your music. For sure. I think there's a level of like promotion there. I don't really know that that's exclusive to a publisher. I think mm. a label would do that as well. But um, I'm, I'm sure that they get involved in that kind of promotion yeah. capacity too. Cool. And so do you have advice for new artists and specifically independent artists for um, 
registering and getting paid from those different those different avenues. Yeah, I would definitely look up. I mean, I think the resource that we talk about a lot at work for anyone just looking to find out more information is musiccreator.ca. Mm. Um, it's a website that has a lot of different information on it for different revenue streams and it even has things like a deal gauge. So if you're an audiovisual composer and you're looking, you, maybe you were just offered a, a, a gig where you're writing music for a new movie, you can kind of look and see what would be a normal um, budget to expect and things like that. Uh, it's a great resource. But yeah, if you're an independent singer songwriter, uh, I would definitely suggest signing up with SoCan, mm-hmm. registering your works. I think that's key. I think a lot of people kind of expect that the money gets them, but they don't even realize they're not yet a SoCan member. Like we need you to come to us, give us the information, register your work so that we can pay you. Um, uh, that's that's definitely step one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then using resources like musiccreator.ca to look into all the other revenue options that are available because royalties is just one part of the pie. And even within that, like I said, music copyrights are pretty convoluted. There's different types of royalties to collect, different organizations. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity out there, but you have to go digging a bit. <laughs> mm-hmm. And in terms of... Um... When you register your songs, is it only songs that you have professionally recorded and released on streaming platforms that can get royalties or can songwriters enter anything they want? Uh, I think we typically encourage writers to register close to the song's release, but no, you don't have to be on streaming platforms to get earnings because we're collecting from radio stations, television stations, uh, and on live performances. So let's say, let's say you are playing in a venue and you're playing a song that isn't necessarily on streaming services yet, but you've registered it with us. Um, the fact that you've registered it with us and then you go and submit your set list and we get a license fee from the venue, we can pay you for that song. Mm-hmm. So any type of performance that's covered under performing rights, we can pay out on. It doesn't have to just be online streaming. Yeah, so if you're if you're perform, you can submit like your a rec- like an acoustic recording let's say this song i wrote i'm performing it at x y and z venue and that, that yeah would be i mean i think the other thing people I-, I get why it's confusing but we don't actually collect recordings right so you don't actually mm-hmm. just send us recordings of your music when you submit registrations of your songs it's just mm-hmm. the songwriter data um and then our system will match you know performance of this song took place here it'll match to the registration we have on hand and it'll pay out accordingly very cool yeah that's, that's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I find it very difficult to keep track of all of the, the details of um, just like those bookkeeping details and okay, I played mm-hmm. this show on this date and I, this is my set list and these are the songs. I'm getting better at it, but uh, there's definitely many shows that I have no recollection of what I played. Um, and sure. or how much money I made, which is, you know, that's not good. But um, do you have any advice just in general for keeping track of details? Yeah, if you're doing like full time freelancing as an artist, for example, I know a lot of people use software like QuickBooks um, just to kind of keep track of not only income, but expenses. Mm. Um, I know for me, with my commission arrangements, I do a lot of invoicing. I'm not doing as much of that for, you know, live performances because... It's not really the bulk of my work, but yeah, invoicing is a big thing. Um, I, I definitely would say, I mean, if you can always keep track of your set lists and your performance mm-hmm. dates, especially for SoCan purposes, because we need that information to pay out. But uh, yeah, doing personal admin as a freelancer can be a lot of work. Like It's a lot of yeah. extra hours to be putting in on top of what you actually do as a freelancer, but it's really important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I find that nowadays i spend so much time just on my computer writing emails and doing like grants applications and just writing writing descriptions for videos and and all of those things so it's hard to it's definitely hard to keep a balance between those things and being creative for sure it's a lot unfortunately but yeah it's um it's important stuff yeah oh for sure what is what is something about SOCAN and performing rights organizations in general that not a lot of people know, but they sh- you think that they should know? That's a good question. Um, hmm. 
there are a lot of different things because I feel like everyone's level of education when it comes to music copyright or just royalties in general is kind of all over the place. Um, if you're at the level of not knowing what Selkane is, I would say sign up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if you're at the level of being a member but not submitting your works, I would say register your works. Um, and if you're already a member, I'd say maybe, you know, look into the perks of being a member. You know, we have things like our houses in Nashville and LA, and I think we're going to start one up in Paris again. We had one before the pandemic, but we lost it during those times. So, you know, there's there's benefits available to our members for very low cost. I think, for example, the Nashville and LA houses, I don't think it's an actual cost to the member to book. It's it's just the cleaning fee that you pay at the end of the week, which is pretty small in comparison to what it would cost to get like a hotel room in Nashville or LA, for example. Um, they are high in demand, but you have to just, if, if, if it's available when you're going, you can book it as a member. Um, wow. Yeah, it, there's some great stuff that's available to people. Um, I also think I mean, if, if people are really interested in music copyright and things like that, I hope people know that SoCan's always trying to update our distribution rules to best suit our members. Like we, you know, during COVID lockdowns introduced online streaming concerts or online like Facebook concert payouts, which we hadn't done before because we're always trying to maximize royalties for members. Um, and it can be convoluted. It can be really difficult to understand. But um, yeah, it, it's there mm-hmm. because we're trying to do good by our members. Um, and making sure that people can make a living off of the art they create. Very cool. Yeah, I didn't even know you guys had houses in different... Yeah, there. I think it's just Nashville and LA right now, but hopefully there's a Paris one back soon. Very cool. Did you find that it was a gradual transition for you going from more of a creative performance-based focus into dealing with more music business uh, things in your career or was it was it like a black and white switch um I definitely think it was gradual and I think because I still maintain my freelance work I get to have that kind of split in my life of being an artist and also working with artists or for artists um for me it felt like a natural transition into the music business side because so can especially was one of my interests I as an arranger knew that copyright was going to be a thing that I needed to know about if I wanted to do arranging full-time. Turns out copyright makes arranging very difficult, Um, understandably so. And I wanted to figure out the systems by which people are credited for their work Mm -hmm. and paid for their work. So copyright just became a natural interest of mine in the music space. Uh, So when I did land a job at SoCan, I was really, really excited about that. Um, And also, I think just having that kind of background of I'm because of that background and arranging and things like that. I was I was very, very you know, adamant about this idea that the the arts should uh, careers in the arts should offer a living wage, mm-hmm. and I thought SoCan was uh, a means by which people get paid and is a big advocate for those kinds of messages. So it aligned really well with my personal values, and I think through working at SoCan and being so involved in the industry it's just kind of opened my eyes to all these different opportunities in the industry and kind of made me realize how much I love the business side of things, despite the fact that I was a creative first. So I always joke that I was a musician by trade. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm really grateful to have landed here. It, it, it for a while felt like a bit of a balancing act, trying to be both an artist and a business person. But I think I've kind of found the middle ground for myself or where I'm mm-hmm. happy to be. Um, I kind of just want to keep growing. Yeah. My career. Yeah. Awesome. And going back to what you were saying about copyright, uh, that is that is a whole other beast. <laughs> yeah. Well. I mean, yeah, I think actually if we're talking about misconceptions, I think a lot of people think when you register your work with SoCan that it counts as copywriting it. Um, SoCan doesn't copyright anything, but you also don't need to formally register your work anywhere for it to be like copyrighted. The minute you fix your work into a tangible form so it could be like recording or i guess writing it down or something that counts as it being copyrighted if you really want to get official about it you can go to the canadian intellectual property office but it's not necessary um so it it kind of exists as soon as you create it Mm. and is it is it important to like if you're even if you're writing it down in a notebook or something to have dates on when when that Um, was yeah i imagine it can be helpful i mean I'm not a copyright lawyer, so I can't speak to, you know, how, how well things hold up in like a court case, but I think 
in general, good practice is to just include as much detail as you can. So yeah. it doesn't help. It doesn't, doesn't hurt. Sorry. Mm-hmm. It doesn't help. It probably does help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've heard, I've heard that, um, so in the past, a common practice was that they put their song on a CD and then mail it to themselves so that you had the, the date that it was mailed and it stamped yeah. and everything. But ep- I've heard of that too. Um, I don't really know the specific reasoning behind it. Because like I said, as soon as you've fixed your work into a tangible form, the copyright exists. So mm-hmm. I've definitely heard those kinds of stories. Yeah. To my knowledge, they're not necessary. But with all things copyright um, and, and legal, I would say consult a lawyer and not me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean... More, more so on that, if if you are an artist in need of legal advice, there is the Artist Legal Advice Services Center. I think they go by Alas, yeah. and it is free legal advice, you know, with some limitations. They can't, like, I don't think they'll, like, represent you in court, but they do offer legal advice to artists, mm. artists I think. Ooh. I've definitely used them before, and I'm, I'm hopeful they still exist. <laughs> That's very cool. I feel like the rules change so so often, so yeah. it's always good to Yeah, get. I don't really know. I think maybe the existence of, you know, at home recording software maybe makes it a little easier to just track mm-hmm. you know okay clearly you made this file on this day and time um but i also think we've gone a bit into the weeds in music copyright like what what ideas you might try to say you've copyrighted in their creation versus you know yeah. if someone's sampling something and interpolations it's 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 complicated yeah and this is why i'm not a lawyer because <laughs> <laughs> i don't want to do that <laughs> me too <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your advice though it's oh for sure yeah. i think i might you turned my soak hand brain on and i was just like here's the things that i tell people <laughs> to do <laughs> yeah, but a lot of people don't like i i registered with soak this year and i probably should have done it a long time ago but it's you know it's something that if you don't know it exists or or even if you do know it exists and you don't really know what it does for you as an artist, it, it can be it can take a bit of time to get started with it. Yeah, exactly. And I think, especially with online distributors, like people who use DistroKid or comparable online mm-hmm. stuff, a lot of those companies, you know, people expect to or do receive payment through them. So they think that's kind of like the source of royalties. And I, I believe it can be, to be 100% mm-hmm. honest. I'm, I'm not sure which royalties are coming back to people through DistroKid. I have not gotten any royalties to just joke it myself, but <laughs> but um, I know people do I mean, receive payment. One day I'm just going to buy a nice cup of coffee with my just joke royalties. I mean, I got my first so can payout like November, I believe, because I finally reached the threshold to receive payout, which is 25 cents for direct deposit. I was like, yay, <laughs> 25 cents. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got to start somewhere. Yeah. I find that... Some sometimes people are deterred from signing up with these things because if you know unless your music gains a lot of traction, it's the payout is usually really low. Um, mm. And so, like, what would you say to those people who haven't registered yet? I totally get that logic, but I also think some money is better than no money, and <laughs> I also think you know if you're not registering, then we just have that money. I mean. I can't speak to all the operational side of things and what actually goes on on that side of things. But what I will say is like, if your music's getting played and it's generating revenue, then you're owed that revenue no matter how small it is. And that belongs to you. And we can't give it to you unless you sign up with us. Mm -hmm. So unless you're registering your works, you know, there's, even if, even if you think it's a small amount of money, there's money that is probably owed to you. And especially if you're not signing up within, you know, our threshold for how far back we can go on things like adjustments. Um, we, we want to be able to pay you that money, even if it's a little amount. So it, it it's rightfully yours. <laughs> we just need you to give us the information we need so that you can collect it. Mm-hmm. Reaching the end of the interview. Uh, so I have a last couple of questions. Do you have any upcoming projects that you would like to share on the podcast? Um... I'm still songwriting and not Yay. enough to like have a formal project together yet, but I'm slowly putting stuff together. And then um, arrangement wise, it's mostly just commission stuff. So 
no projects of my own aside from beat sync and hopefully we're gonna be putting on some performances this year so if anyone listening needs an arranger and you can commission <laughs> Kristen. yeah what resource or piece of advice would you give your younger self when you were beginning your journey Ooh, that's tough um I don't even know if I would say these specifically for myself because all the resources that come to mind, I'm like, I don't know if I would have wanted that or needed that at that age. But like Mm -hmm. in general, if you are a Canadian creator, check out musiccreator.ca. And if you are interested in careers in music and just the arts in general, uh, check out uh, Work in Culture, the website. Mm -hmm. They have a job board where they're always posting. It's not music specific, but arts careers, which is really cool. Awesome. Thanks for that. Do you have a song recommendation for our playlist? I picked Stand by Yama because it's the song that I did an arrangement of at the beginning. Um, oh, yeah. And I just think it's a beautiful song. It's beautiful. So you can listen to that song on our guest recommendation playlist, and then you can go and listen to Kristen's version on her Instagram. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> We are at the end of our interview. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Bedroom Studios podcast. Don't forget to add this podcast to your playlist and to like and follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and Spotify at Bedroom Studios Podcast. Also make sure to follow our playlist of guest music recommendations as well as music our guests have created. We have recently started a playlist called BSP Song Spotlight, which contains music from podcast guests in season one and in season two. So please check that out to support our guest artists. Kristen's website and Instagram will also be linked in the description if you want to check out her music. Thanks again for listening to the Bedroom Studios podcast, and we'll see you in the next episode.